You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. With Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk. Welcome in to Blue Jays Nation Radio, episode 96. I am Cam Lewis hosting our Major League Baseball 2022 draft special along with BK and our prospects guy, Brennan Delaney, who I think I'm going to call BD because we have a Brendan and a Brennan, which is not going to work at all. So there's going to be a BK and a BD, and I'm going two letters for the both of you guys. BK, thanks for coming on. BD, thanks for coming on. We're going to talk Major League Baseball draft, but before we get into that, I got to do the ad read in which we are brought to you by DoorDash. Ding dong, use promo code BJNPODDD, and if you're a first-time user, you will get 25% off whatever you'd like to order tonight. So go ahead and get Wendy's or something else. Probably just Wendy's. I couldn't think of anything else off the top of my head. So that's that. Anyways, we're going to talk about the Major League Baseball draft in which the Blue Jays added a handful of new guys. Before we do that, though, because MLB's draft is probably the most in-depth and, I guess, for a lack of a better term, weird than the other drafts, BK, I'm going to get you to give kind of an explanation of how this draft works and what strategies are and what different teams are doing. Yeah, I guess the biggest takeaway or the biggest thing to note going into it is it's not always best player available. That's not how teams draft in baseball always. They do sometimes, right? But um, it, it, unlike other drafts, there are variable amounts you can spend on a pick. And the Blue Jays, like every other team, based on where their picks are rounds through 1 through 10, have a certain number of money they're allowed to spend. So for the Blue Jays this year, that came uh, to about $8.36 million dollars. Uh, was their uh, quote-unquote draft pool or bonus pool available to them. And within that pool, you decide how you want to spend it, right? So if you draft a high school kid who has a lot of leverage because he could say, hey, I'm going to college if you don't give me X amount of money, then, uh, well, that you've got to pay up or you maybe don't draft that guy. And you draft a college guy, you may be able to uh, pay him less than the slot money and then use some of those savings later in the draft. So that's a very brief rundown. Um, another note is uh, teams are allowed to go 5% over their pool. So for the Blue Jays, that's another $418,000 they have to spend. Um, and all you do, the, the only punishment for that is it's taxed. Um, anything over 5%, you start losing draft picks in the next year. So uh, teams tend to not do that. Uh, I don't think we've, since these rules have been in place, no teams exceeded their draft pool by 5%. But a lot of the smart teams, uh, the teams big on development, spend every dollar they can. Uh, so for the Jays, that total number this year is uh, just shy of $8.8 million. Right. Interesting. Brennan, do you want to add something about the draft? Any thoughts? I mean, firstly, I wish I had that much money. But um, yeah, so uh, you have a slot value assigned to each pick, and that stops at the, uh, the 10th round. So from the 11th round on, you have a total of 125000 And now you can still go over that, but it does dig into your bonus pool money. But if you if you stay at one uh, 125000 or under, it doesn't count towards your bonus pool money. It's the only thing I add on. Interesting. Cool. So the first pick the Blue Jays made was number 23 overall, and this was their own pick. And what they did is go with a high school pitcher, which is pretty out of character for them. I think I saw on Twitter the last time they drafted and signed a high school pitcher was Dustin McGowan in 2000. So pretty rare, pretty rare. Yes, yeah. It's a very, very different thing for the Blue Jays. So what do we think about pick number 23? Yeah. So uh, Brandon Barriera out of high school in Florida, um, as a general rule, I'm not big on high school arms in the first round, just because they're the most volatile prospect you can get. Um, of course, if you're going to draft one, um, I'm probably more comfortable with that in the twenties than if you're say spending a top 10 pick on a high school pitcher. Um, but yeah, Barriera obviously was ranked very highly. Uh, most sites had him right around where the Jays picked or much higher, uh, fan graphs, athletic, uh, baseball, America, all those places, uh, were pretty high on his stuff. Um, his ability to grow into uh, some, you know, a, a little bit, uh, a little bit more velocity potentially in play. Um, Fangraphs had the most interesting uh, title on him or, or write up on him because they basically said he was a shorter Tiedemann, and that was before the Jays picked him. So that wasn't a, based on the Jays picking him, but they said uh, much like Tiedemann out of high school, uh, they have very similar frames, uh, just with Barriera being an inch or two shorter. So. Uh, a very interesting arm. Um, he's got four uh, really strong pitches, uh, plus pitches, uh, 
grades they've uh, been given by a lot of these prospect evaluators. And while I say that, I'll say, you know, me and Brendan watch some video of these guys and we try and learn what we can, but we're not at the field watching them and getting the scouting reads. So uh, for myself, I mean, a lot of this is just pulling information from other sites and forming opinions based on people I respect and uh, what their uh, write-ups are on a prospect. But uh, yeah, really interesting to see the the Tiedemann uh, comp and his slot money com comes in just under $3.1 million. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what he signs for. He might have had a number on himself that was higher than that. Uh, I'd be curious to see how that plays out. Brennan, before I let you talk, I just wanted to bring one more thing up is that we're hearing a lot about how prospects are now more interested to sign with the Blue Jays because of that complex they have in Dunedin. And I think we've seen that now with Ricky Tiedemann and he comes out like he shot it up a cannon as a pitcher and he's ripping up the levels. Now he starts in low A Dunedin makes a handful of starts and up to Vancouver. He makes eight starts. And now apparently reportedly Scott Mitchell said he's going up to double A right after the all-star break. So, I mean, is this like a, like a, like a thing we can expect from pitchers now that the Dunedin complex is a thing or was Tiedemann just kind of like a, like a once in a lifetime prospect. I can get this. Um, the optimist in me says that it is uh, an ongoing thing that will continue. Um, again, they have a lot of other good prospects. It's not just human. Like, uh, Bahian Santos is doing well, but I, I don't want to get too much into it. Um, I could definitely see a, a lot more young arms. It could become a pitcher development uh, organization in the near future, I think. That's what we're hoping for because we're seeing teams like the Yankees, for example, or all of a sudden just like finding whatever random arm and turning them into someone who throws like an unhittable slider. So then after that, the Blue Jays then with their second pick, which is number 60 overall, they go away from the pitcher road and now we're starting to see them draft position players. What do we think about the Blue Jays second pick at number 60 overall? Yeah. So Kasevich, um, a shortstop or he played shortstop at Oregon a uh, really interesting profile, and there's a bit of a theme for the Jays this draft with the uh, the, the hitters they were drafting out of college. Uh, high contact rate. Um, he struck out, I want to say it's a little over 5% of the time uh, at the University of Oregon playing in a big baseball conference, the Pac-12. So his uh, contact rate was basically best in uh, Division One. And one of the most interesting things I saw just going through these, again, these different prospect sites, Fangraphs put a future hit tool of 70 on him. Uh, Kasevich had the highest future hit tool of any prospect they graded, um, including the guys who were drafted in the top 10. So basically he's a, he's a premium, he's a contact hitter, does not strike out much, uh, does not swing and miss much. And it's not loud contact. Um, a, a comp I've seen put on him a couple times is David Fletcher with the angels, uh, a little bit better defensively potentially, but um, and uh, a little bit louder contact than David Fletcher, but that's not saying much uh, when you're making that comparison. But yeah, I mean, just a, a really useful player. And uh, like I said, there's a bit of a theme of the Jays seemingly valuing these contact guys and, uh, you know, much in the discussion on the pitching side of the Dunedin facility, uh, they can use some of their tools there to maybe fine tune swing mechanics and uh, ball contact points to try and get a little bit more uh, exit velo out of some of these guys. Yeah, I think Blue Jays fans are going to be happy to hear about this profile of player as I think everyone's kind of mentally burnt out from watching the very swing-happy approach of the Toronto Blue Jays currently. Brennan, what do you think Slider about Kasevich? Are you happy with this pick? I didn't surprise the person. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. It did surprise me. Um, I like how he profiles as a uh, defensive shortstop, though. They don't have a lot of those in the high minors, so I think he kind of slots right in there right away. Uh, again, I, I always look for a uh, high walk rate, low strikeout rate, and he does fit that profile. Uh, good slash, good slash, and, and he could add more power in the near future as well. So there's there's definitely lots of like in the case of it. Good money ball approach. You always want to find the guys in the minor leagues who are taking walks. Uh, so now we're moving on to the picks that the Jays had because of the free agents they lost last year, and that was Robbie Ray and Marcus Semyon, of course. Both were qualified both walked. They had number 77 overall and number 78 overall. Number 77 was a guy who I think most people didn't expect to be there when the Blue Jays were selecting, and that's Tucker Toman. What are your thoughts on Tucker Toman at number 77? Yeah, that was a very interesting pick. Uh, 
the the highest grade of him was ESPN uh, had them as their 15th ranked uh, prospect. So to get him at 77, obviously is a big deal. And that goes back to what we talked about in the intro. He is going to be a guy who signs for money well over his slot value. His slot value is about $850,000. There was some word of his, I think, uh, I think it was the fan graphs guys um, saying they they heard whispers of 2.5 million being his, uh, pre-draft numbers. So uh, it's going to take a decent amount to sign him. I don't know if it'll be that. He did speak very highly of the Jays uh, and wanting to come to the Jays. And it kind of felt like a Bo Bichette conversation from years back where he was targeting certain teams and Bo Bichette had a higher number for himself on teams he didn't want to go to than teams he did. And uh, that may have been how this played out as well. And a very interesting thing about how this played out is we got word of this pick happening before the Jays pick 60th. And again, a very weird component of the baseball draft. Jays haven't even picked 60. And Tucker Toman's dad is announcing at their draft party in Tennessee somewhere uh, that uh, he will be signing uh, for, he didn't you know, broadcast the number, but he said he will be signing uh, with the Jays uh, after being selected pick 77. And this was reported by, I guess, the local high school sports reporter. Um, That's a in, great scoop. Again, wherever this Tennessee <laughs> location is, this rural Tennessee area, uh, he was in the house at the draft party and reported this and put it out on Twitter. And it seemed believable, but also you wanted to actually wait to see how and if it would play out that way. And it did. So, yeah, really interesting that the Jays basically um, liked uh, Kasovic or Kasovic, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, enough to... Um, they had, they knew they had to take him 60 or he'd probably go to another team before their next fix, but they knew at the dollar amount they had promised Toman and the agreement they had made and the leverage Toman had of going to college that they could float him down to the 77th pick and just over slot him, uh, there. So yeah, really interesting how that played out, but, uh, a bat I really liked coming into the draft, a switch hitter, uh, looks to be a third baseman. He's got power from both sides of the plate. And uh, yeah, really, uh, re- really good pick. Basically what the Jays did for day one was they landed themselves two first rounders and two second rounders. And uh, just, just as far as talent goes and that type of thing. So a, a really tidy uh, day one of the draft for the, uh, for the Jays. And, and Brandon will have a little bit more to say about their uh, final pick on day one. Yeah, Brennan's going to go and give us a uh, bunch of information about number 78 overall pick, compensatory draft pick, Kate Doughty, who sounds like a hockey player. It does. <laughs> so uh, you can play both second base and third base, but he was moved mainly to second base due to their third baseman that I'm blanking on the name. Uh, he actually filled out his frame before coming into the season, which led to more home runs, but it also kind of changed his approach as he, his K percentage did, uh, it did increase a little bit. Not, not too much that I worry about it. Just there is a little bit of swing and miss in his game. Uh, throughout his college career, he slashed 301, 378, four, uh, sorry, 541. And he also had eight homers and 281 plate appearances in the summer league, which uses wooden bats. So the transition between uh, aluminum to wooden sometimes does factor into uh, exit velocity issues, such as like Austin Martin back in uh, 2021. So it's good to see that he has experience with wooden bats and also hidden home runs um he doesn't have the fastest bat speed that's something that is noted but he's very good at timing the ball and having his bat in the right spot to hit it to barrel it so there's a lot to like about dowdy like i I drafted him in uh, ootp before but (laughs) uh yeah i i do like that pick especially because again he is a second round pick and uh, I think he will probably start in high A, if I had to guess, maybe maybe low A. But uh, I, I think there's a lot to like with Kate Downey. Yeah, that moves us on to kind of the next thing to talk about with this draft is you guys both talked off the hop in the show that teams operate with kind of a strategy. Sometimes you'll see them pick some fourth-year college guy in the first round, maybe like a Logan Warmoth type that isn't going to command too much cash so you can sign guys later on. Is that kind of what we're seeing right here? Are we gonna are we seeing some picks they've made that are late that seem like home runs? Are we seeing, you know, are we seeing are we gonna see money move around when it comes to signing bonuses? It seems like uh, a vast majority of the Jays' money is going to be attributed to day one picks. And day two, um, not that the team doesn't like who they're selecting, uh, they certainly do to be uh, drafting them. 
But once you get into day two and, and you know, that third, fourth round, you're talking signing bonus, uh, signing bonus pool slots of like 350, 450, 600,000, um, obviously just declining the further in the draft you go. And those guys are not going to be signing for the slot money. So that's where they will slowly make up uh, that Toman uh, dollar figure. So, so yeah, a lot of the money was spent early. The Jays have done both sides of this draft, right? Like we've seen them in the past, uh, Jordan Groshans. Uh, signed for, I want to say it was like 1.2 million below slot. And uh, the Jays ended up taking Klopfenstein um, the next day uh, and, and using a lot of that money difference and spending more there. And then, uh, yeah, the Austin Martin draft, the, the Jays in a very rare instance where you have a college guy who actually got above slot. But uh, the Jays got Austin Martin fifth, which was at the time seemingly a great deal and they had to pay for it. Um, and then that impacted how the rest of their draft went and uh, where they could spend that money. So, um, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, basically, uh, rounds three through 10 were just signability guys. Um, I, uh, Brennan, if I'm not mistaken, it was college guys across the board, right? All the way three through oh, yeah. Yeah, 10. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and, and some of those are fifth year seniors. So as you can imagine, a 23 year old in college who was draft eligible two years ago and still hasn't signed, um, that's not a guy with a lot of leverage, uh, and you're going to be able to sign him for way less than his. That's a one thousand dollars signing bonus. Yeah, that's like we've a, seen those in the past, <laughs> right? Kevin Pillar signing OG. bonus. Exactly, we've seen that uh, going back to the AA era, um, and in the current era, it's just a, a tool teams utilize to to make off the diff- make up the difference. So, um, yeah, and uh, obviously, still some guys to like in day two, and uh, Brennan can talk about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll lead you in there. Brennan wrote about every single player the Blue Jays drafted, which is an impressive thing, I will say, in my Fake experience. Fake others on 40 rounds. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was about to say is I, I personally feel like it's kind of a shame. I like the days when there was 40 guys each team being drafted just so you can, like, run through a hilarious list of names. But it was even, like, in in – I think I feel like the, the draft used to be like 65, 70 rounds. I know Mike Piazza, I think, was drafted, what, 56th round or something like that? So they continue to slash it down, which is a bit of a shame. But anyways, Brennan wrote about every single one of these guys, which is one heck of a task. Uh, Brennan, what do you think? Is there anybody that was selected on the later days of the draft that are worth keeping an eye on? Uh, I'd like to focus more on the second day, just because um, I think they drafted a lot of what they need in college relievers that will quickly make the jump up the minor leagues. And a lot of these college relievers have a lot of swing and miss. So it's nice to see. And another point I want to add on is uh, I think their eighth rounder, Dylan Rock, is four days older than me. That was the only player drafted that is older than me. And I still feel still feel young. Oh, but you got the, a ways to go, buddy. You got <laughs> ways to go. Oh, uh, man. I miss being 18. <laughs> so um, the two players that I kind of wanted to focus on were uh, Rodin, uh, Alan Rodin and Pin Williams, who I absolutely love, but we'll start with Rodin. He, uh, in 418 played appearances, he slashed 383, 484, 640. He struck out only eight times this past season in uh, 100 and yeah, 200 or so played appearances, 242. What league is this? Is this like a soft, like a slow pitch underhand league? Uh, I believe he played for uh, Creighton, so it's it those means... are video game numbers, man. That's like, <laughs> yeah, striking absolutely. out that few amount of times is pretty impressive. It's like me going on a rookie of the show and just smashing dingers, <laughs> but uh, he didn't face a lot of premium pitching in that college division, and uh, he plays mainly first base. And you, you know, there's a guy named Vlad Junior at uh, at, uh, at first. He does have impressive exit velocities and. He only had four dingers this past season, but it was a pitcher's park. And he also had, I believe, five homers and just 165 plate appearances in a summer league. Again, with the wooden bat, I think it does matter. Uh, the other guy, Payne Williams, absolutely love this guy. When I say his height and weight, you're going to be like, oh, that guy just hits dingers. It's not true, though. So he's 6'5", 255. He weighs like Ooh. five more pounds than me. Six he's, times. <laughs> he slashed 317, 445, 593. He uses all parts of the field. And he uh, he had 13 home runs in summer league as well. Like in just like 134 plate appearances or something like that. It was crazy. Uh, he also just walked as many times as he struck out. So I believe it was 35 apiece. But it wasn't just like, oh, he's, he's a... Uh, he's a junior like he obviously is more developed he was doing this before as well so this uh between the two years in uh, freshman and 
sophomore, he only struck out six more times than he walked. And it was three piece, three more times that he struck out. So th- there's a lot to like in him. And I, again, I just like those like out of the ordinary framed. Uh, You're a big players. Alejandro Kirk fan. I, oh yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, so you're excited to see the Jays number. draft like a Daniel Vogelbach type player. <laughs> BK, what are you thinking? Do you have any, any names that you found in the second and third days that you think are worth keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce the last name, but 18th pick, Jeremy uh, Pilon. Pilon? If we're going to, if we're going to French it up, uh, Pilon. Um, he is from Quebec, uh, which the unique nature of him uh, as a high schooler is he was drafted at 16 years old, which there are high schoolers in the draft, many who are drafted at 19 years old. So the Jays got a left-handed pitcher, a very interesting one. Um, he's, he's touched 90 to 91 miles an hour, but uh, a Canadian kid uh, who doesn't turn 17 until uh, sometime in September. And, uh, you know, performed very well in the Canadian junior national teams. So he was the youngest guy by far drafted um, because there are rules around uh, age and graduation that uh, are need, needed to be met to be draft eligible. And uh, he uniquely qualified for both just barely by being a, a, you know, from Quebec. So, yeah, it's cool to see uh, a Canadian kid drafted in the 18th round. I hope he signs. Um, I, I believe there was five uh, high schoolers in rounds 11 through 20. And the Jays, it would seem, wouldn't have a lot of money they can pull from days one and two to sign them for any more than that $125,000 mark that uh, Brandon broke down in the intro. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many of those uh, guys they sign. There have been some verbal uh, commitments or rumors on Twitter of uh, a couple of them. But, uh, but yeah, Jeremy uh, Pallone, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get the Canadian signed and down to Dunedin where the, the lab can get to work on a 16, 17-year-old and see what uh, some additional growth and, and uh, lab work can do for the velocity. That's completely insane to me. Just like the idea of us talking about like, but then again, like we also have like the international free agency oh. period where it doesn't seem beyond question to just add a 16 year old from Latin America. What well, you start talking about them when they're 14. <laughs> yeah, I know. We've, 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 we've unironically spoken about like 12 year old siblings of Vladimir Guerrero, which is completely insane, but that's also not like soccer level either, which is a whole different thing. Like yeah. we're talking all about of it's like, bad. Uh, all of it's very bad probably far too young uh to have to be worrying about stuff like that but it's it's interesting the Guerrero bloodlines are strong and the Jays do a very good job in international free agency and that involves um pretending you're not talking to the kids when they're 13 and 14 when you de- definitely most definitely are so um yeah yeah it's interesting to actually see that happen in the draft because I don't I don't ever recall a 16 year old going in the draft uh 17 is certainly the youngest I can remember so so now here's a question for the both of you guys is how many of these prospects are inevitably going to be used in this summer's Juan Soto trade? Zero, because they're Zero. not eligible. Oh, you're exactly. right. I forgot about that. Yeah, well, I was, I was talking on another pod and they said apparently it's not that important anymore since uh, I think a trade back in 2014 or something, but they probably won't be traded no matter what. So, so who are the Jets going to include in that deal then? Who are they going to send to Washington for Juan uh, Soto? I don't speculate on trades, sir, but uh, yeah. top prospects. And, yeah. Uh, uh, it starts with Moreno and possibly Bo, and it depends what Washington wants. And I can't imagine the Jays are uh, the ones to be fulfilling that. Where do you uh, think he ends up? San Diego seems plausible, really? quite plausible. Um, they've, they've got – they continue to have just some – high upside talent in the minors and and some you know major league ready premium talent like cj abrams and look if the jays are, are willing to talk moreno um plus 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 then they're very much in the conversation so uh that can happen um but man i'd, I'd be surprised but uh yeah, you know, i don't think it's happening either the yankees else. have been uh, you know as much as their reputation is like the freewheeling big spending yankees they have not been a prospect like, you know, diving into their very premium prospects and trading them. They have not done that. They've, they've had more fringy guys or, you know, maybe the guys ranked like five to 10 that they've identified as willing to trade. But even like the Jays, you know, trade for a Barrios last year, that's not a move the Yankees have really looked to make. 
um, the last few years. So, you know, I don't know if that's a, if that's just a, a plan or, a, you know, what, how they view prospects in totality, or if maybe they've been waiting for the right move to go and do that. So goodness, here's hoping it's not the Yankees, but they certainly have, um, you know, the, some of the firepower to get that done as well. Yeah. But, that would uh, be yeah, super San Diego, put him in that, stay in the national league, right? I want to cheer okay. for Soto and not have anything he does uh, negatively impact the Blue Jays. The Mariners are unfortunately another team that actually kind of makes sense that could pull it off that I very much would not like to see. That'd be here's fun. a name. Here's a name for me out of left field, just because they were hot before the All Star break, and because they're in the American League East, the Orioles. Let's see the Orioles make a huge splash and uh, become a contending team in the American League East this season. They yeah, definitely do it. Yeah, they they got the prospect pool to do it, right? And they're in the mix. Why not? Go ahead and make your um, 2015 Blue Jays trade. I so if I'm the cry. Orioles, I wouldn't do that because when you rebuild as hard as they did, and despite the standings right now, I'm still comfortable calling them a non-contender. Ooh. Which please don't clip that for when they're past the Blue Jays to finish the season. But uh, I, yeah, I, w- when you rebuild and have like zero money on the books, like the Orioles, they should spend right. Like in free agency, they should just spend everything, but keep the prospects because you don't need to acquire cost controlled talent. It doesn't benefit your books. You've got so much money to spend. So um, yeah, the Orioles unfortunately might just go wild in free agency in the next year or two. And that'll be no fun. And okay, but the, who wants to live in Baltimore? Expect them to take. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time the Orioles made like a free agent splash? Who would that have been? Like Mark Trumbo? Ubaldo? Ubaldo might have been it. Remember when he was going to be a Blue Jay? Yeah. Or it was I him and Urban that. Santana around the same time and the guys were going to defer money. They, <laughs> uh, they, signed, remember that. <laughs> they gave Alex Cobb pretty decent money like three or four years ago, like basically they were on the edge of a rebuild, but they're pretending to still like try. Yeah. And then they realized very quickly that wasn't going to work, but yeah, Alex Cobb, you got like 40 million from them, I think. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, they haven't done the mega contracts in free agency, but they gave Chris Davis $160 million. So they've done it. Um, but yeah, to, to bring this back to, uh, to a fun Blue Jays point here, uh, while we're recording this pod, the All-Star game is on. Alec Manoa just struck out two, uh, in a scoreless second inning, pretty uh, pretty exciting. And apparently, he was mic'd up on the Fox feed. The U.S. really mic'd oh, up while great. pitching. So oh, uh, I do have that recorded, uh, and I look forward to watching that after the pod. But uh, yeah, he was he was certainly enjoying himself and fired up and pitching to Kirky and a fun moment for the Blue Jays. I I have to say that Alec Manoa. I'm going to declare this right now. Alec Manoa is the best pick from the 2019 draft. I agree. I think if you were to redo it right now, teams would be like, that's the guy at number one. He's just, he's not quite an ace yet, but he's going to be there very, very soon. He's an ace in my opinion. I think like, yeah, I know. I I don't want to be too spicy today. You know, my first pod with you guys, but no. (laughs) So you come in, you come in at first and you say he's the number one overall pick, but then you won't say he's an ace because that's too spicy. He's an ace because I watched 18 innings of him in triple A and I was like, holy crap, this guy's insane. Just with (laughs) his composure alone. And then you add in a potential change up. It's going to be just, he's so good, man. For me, it's the fact that he's he's kind of just come up, and I don't really recall too many times he's made a bad start. You're like this guy every single time; it's good, and that's that's really something for the Jays to just go ahead and find this guy and kind of like not that high of a pick either. It's like they're picking third overall that year, and they found themselves this like two years later. It's absolutely mind boggling. We well, had this minutes. exact same uh, conversation on the pod, right? We talked about that. We always do draft yeah. and and basically, yeah, he he'd be top three certainly. Um, and then, I mean, you can make an argument for any of those guys, Bobby Witt, Abbey Rutschman, uh, and Manoa are all very interesting. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, regardless, picking 11 and getting a borderline ace who's MLB ready within two years is virtually, I mean, incredibly rare, right? Like not unheard of, but, but very, very rare. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously a, a huge win for the Jays uh, development team because, yeah, I mean, picks like that, um, whether they're in the first round or later are what help create sustainable winning, right? So if that's the goal, those are the picks you want to hit on. And uh, yeah, hopefully the takeaway from this draft is uh, a number of uh, future Blue Jays and future trade chips to secure the Juan Sotos of the world. 
That's right. Yeah. So we're feeling pretty good about the draft. What would you guys both give the Jays a letter grade for this draft? And this is impossible to do. Impossible because you don't know how good anyone's going to be. No one's signed yet. But let's finish off with some some letter grades. A plus. Easily. A plus. Yeah. Sure. BK, what are you thinking? I'd go B plus. I still like. I I've I very much talked myself into uh, uh, Barriera, but I you know if my if my priors are. I don't love high school pitchers in the first round, more or less, no matter what. Um, then I need to stick to that. But then they went and get got another guy who I would have been fine with them taking in the first round at 77, right? So um, they did a lot of uh, a lot of good. Uh, they've got this core four. I think you look at the draft, you've got this you know core four of guys who separate themselves above the rest of the talent pool. Um, but there's traits up and down the draft that are very encouraging and some guys that can develop, and uh, a lot of good can come out of this draft. But, yeah, I'm comfortable with the B plus. Cool. Well, I'll meet you guys in the middle, and we'll call it an A-. minus. Seems very good to me. Lots of promise. They're going to load somebody up into the Dunedin factory and shoot them out of a cannon, and we're going to be screaming, call them up within the next year. That's what I'm hoping for. Anyways, thank you, BK, for coming on. Thank you, Brennan, for coming on. We have the MLB All-Star game right now. We're all going to go watch it, I imagine. Then we have a few days off, and the Blue Jays are back in Boston to play the Red Sox in a very important beginning in the second half series they have to do well in because the American League East yet again is very tight. Yeah, the Red Sox have lost Chris Sale, which bodes very well for the Blue Jays. That The timing of that injury, that was brutal. But uh, yeah, that works out well for the Jays and, and a critical series right out of the gate. And uh, you should have your three best pitchers going, right? So um, yeah, it's a series you kind of put your best up against their, I guess, wounded best now. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Jays have a chance to create a little bit of separation between them and the Red Sox. They can win the series and that would be pretty significant. All right, Brennan, I'll give you the final word because it looked like you were itching to say something. Oh, no, just not in general. Um, I'm just curious who they would start first three. Is it Manoa? You go Barrios, Manoa, Gosman. That's your one, two, three, I think. I'm not going with Barrios, man. I'm going Alec, Manoa, Gosman, Ross Triplin, who... With Manoa pitching in the All-Star game, though, I think they'll probably Maybe, focus yeah. on a little bit of rest and routine. Um, I'm not sure the order matters as much if you're, you know, just make sure Manoa gets one of those starts. Um, and in that case, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously he only is pitching one inning in the All-Star game. But uh, if you want to just get him back on his regular routine five days between uh, starts, then that would line him up for the Sunday, the finale of the series. So I'm guessing that's the way they go, but it'll be curious to see how they uh, plan it out regardless. That's right. We'll be back on probably Monday. Tyler will be back from his vacation. He's in beautiful British Columbia riding around on a boat. Uh, so we'll be back <laughs> on Monday talking about actual Blue Jays games. Thanks for listening and best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.